So uh, let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kim Hao, and uh, I'm not a TA. I'm not even an engineer this year, but I have been TA for this course for the last two years. And he has a big deadline coming this week, so I'll cover the resonances uh, for him for this week, this week and next week. So as you will see today, uh, bear with me. This is actually the slides from last year, but you saw it there. So today we're going to talk about, yeah, we're going to review the midterms. So I will first um, uh, discuss a few points that you may want to focus on for the midterm, especially the materials we have covered so far in the lectures, and also give some tips uh, because I have uh, been writing the exam papers for this course for the last two years, so I have some experiences I want to share with you and to kind of give you, give you an idea of what we expect when we write the exam papers. So hopefully this will help you to better um, prepare for the uh, exams. And finally, the third part is that I will try to answer any questions you may have about the exam questions for previous years from 2014 and 2015. So we have been um, discussing a few topics in the lectures. The first, them, first of them is the process-related um, topics. Right? So, so you, you have to understand uh, what's the process abstraction in particular, uh, which uh, of these parts are abstraction of what. So we use thread to model the CPU, and in the OS161 code, you will see um, a thread as an execution unit. And so that's the thread is nothing but the executing piece of code. And we use the address space to, add, to provide abstraction of memory, and you will play with this a lot in the semester. And also we use file to um, provide abstraction for the disk, in particular, you need to understand this. Um, the, 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 so the first report concept in the file extraction is the file table, which you place uh, with the file with a lot in a right? So you have to understand the three levels of abstractions that file tables provide. What are the three levels of abstractions? So first we have, at the very most abstract level, we have the what? File description, which is nothing but an integer. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then the second level of abstraction, we have the file handle. Right? So file handle basically encapsulates the information about this file and where it's stored and what was, where it's uh, stored in the disk and how far we have to read or write uh, in, in, within the file. And the final level of abstraction is the, the uh, blocks on the disk. That's been the payload concept in the OS161. So you, you, have, you need to understand the abstractions in the file system. And you, you, may, you may want to review the file syscalls in assignment 2 to better help you understand the concept we have been covered in the lectures. So this is the first topic uh, about the process abstraction. And next, we talk about a few um, synchronization uh, mechanisms. Right? For this uh, part, you need to understand what is a critic section for, for, the, for, for the very beginning. Right? This is the whole reason why we talk about the synchronization in the first place. So a critical section is basically a, a, a resource or a place or a piece of code that can only be executed by one thread or one, or one CPU at any moment. Right? So be, because, uh, it's own, because of this such a mutual access, we want to protect the access to this shared resource, right? What my favorite example of uh, this query section would be a shared printer, right? So suppose you are printing a job and you are printing 15 pages, and then you don't want another uh, computer just come in and start printing right away. Right? In this case, the printer is a shared resource, and you want to protect the access to that shared resource. That's why we have uh, a whole lot of um, primitives and methods to for this synchronization part. Right? So basically, we talk about four uh, synchronization primitives, and also you have a chance to exercise them in the assignments. What are them? 
So for the most basic, you have the logs, right, to protect um, the shared resource. The spin log is provided to you in the OS161 code, and then you ought to write the non spin log. Right? So what's the difference between the spin log and non spin log? One runs, one runs spins, and another sleeps when the resource is not available. Right? Then we have the summable, which is provided to you, and uh, you should have used a lot in your assignments. We say specific models are, are limited resource with a limited quantity. Right? So the summable can be initialized as a counter, and anybody who acquire for this resource will only be get a block when there is no resources available. And next we have what? What are the four uh, condition variables, right? Together with blocks, condition variables, and uh, you can use them to coordinate and access to the shared resources. And then finally, we have the reader and write block, right? Which have, uh, which differentiate the access types to the critical resource. So this is the four um, synchronization primitives, primitives we have uh, discussed. And then finally, we have the lectures also covered the dialogue and how to avoid dialogue. The dialogue is happens when multiple threads or multiple um, entities try to access multiple resources, and each of them holds part of the resource and want to gain access to other part of the resource. That's when dialogue happens. And I remember there uh, are there three or four conditions when dialogue can happen. I remember there. If I remember correctly, it's four, right? So you need to know uh, under which conditions that a dialogue can happen. And these conditions give you a hint of how to break the dialogues, right? What if you break only one, at least one of the conditions, you break the dialogue. So this is the uh, points in the synchronization part. And next, um, the lecture covers interruption handling, which is you also which all you also um, uh, interact a lot in the assignments. So basically, each syscall in the OS one six one is an interruption, and you need to kind of understand what happens when there is an interruption uh, happen. Right. So the first thing uh, to do is when so there is a there is an interruption. Either is the in, uh, exception or an interruption, the first thing the CPU, uh, the CPU does is what? To kind of save the context of what, what, what was happening before the interruption, so that we can resume the execution of when the interruption was handled. Right? And then there are uh, various steps that the CPU takes to handle the interruption. And in its assignment two, you are responsible. You were responsible to write the large chunk of code that handles different types of interruptions. Right? Is is the software interruption a syscall, or and in assignment three, you you actually need to handle another type of interruption, which is the running out of memory, the memory related inter uh, interruptions. So also. Um, you need to kind of understand the concept of context switch. It's easier once you um, have a good idea of what the interrup interruptions are, then context switch is nothing but an interruption follows by uh, another thread, uh, scheduling another thread running on the CPU. And finally, finally um, Jeff talked about various kind of uh, scheduling algorithms in the lecture. And this has been covered a lot in previous years' exams. I don't know if this, he will come, still cover this this year, but this is a very important um, concept to understand what other scheduling errors are there, and what are their differences, and what's their uh, advantages and disadvantages. Any questions so far? Seems everybody has a good understanding of what I have. Um, so, let's see, the, the final part is the memory management, which you do not have a chance to exercise yet, but you will have your will in the next month. Is the so remember at the very beginning we talked about that we use the address space 
to provide an abstraction of the matter. Right? So for this um, topic, you need to understand a, a most important uh, concept, I would say, is the concept of virtual addresses. Right? So you need to understand the difference between a virtual address and a physical address. So what, what, what is a virtual address? What's, how is it different with these physical addresses? Yeah. The virtual address is the address that the process sees. The physical address is the address that it actually maps to. In, uh, exactly. The actual physical way. address is basically the physical address into the RAM bank, right? Where this data is stored to. And the virtual address is the abstraction that was provided to the processes. So in the processes, when you write code, you are always using the virtual address. And there is a whole virtual memory managed system that is responsible to transmit this virtual address to your physical address. And speak of translation, there are different ways to um, kind of do such translation, right? So there are different styles to do the translation. In, in x86 systems, such, such translation was done by hardware. And in the OS161 system, such translation is done by software, which you will be working on in assignment three. So there are, um, so uh, virtual to physical address translation has all also been covered a lot in previous exams. In particular, you have to understand the concept of cache table and know, given a virtual address, how to, given a virtual address, given a cache table, how to translate this virtual, virtual address to the physical address. Or is that, is that even a valid translation at all? Right? So, um, so in the lectures, I think we have been mostly using the 4K page size. So in the exams, Jeff may change the page size to another side to another member to kind of to see whether or not you kind of understand the essence of the page table. And um, finally we have the um, so process memory regions because the uh, process the contains the abstraction of the array space and we how how we split the different segment in the address space and assign them to different purposes, right? We have code regions, which is continuous virtual address block, and we also have data regions and so on. And finally, um, TLB. So first of all, you need to understand what TLB is. Right? It's a translation buffer to basically contains the mapping from uh, virtual address to physical address. And you need to know what TLB is and how to, how, uh, so because it's a buffer, and you, you need to understand why we use such a buffer. Well, whenever you use a buffer, you always want to, and all it's a, you can understand it as a catch, right? So whenever we use a catch, we also we'll always want to speed up the uh, access and catch most, uh, most often used data. So this is the part for the memory management. And I believe that's all the topics we covered so far in the lectures. Am I missing something? So, so next, you may wonder, before, uh, so this is the exam format for previous years. I believe this year, this, it will be pretty much the same. So first you will have 10 multiple choices. Remember, the first one is always kind of uh, a brand teaser, so just don't be knocked off by the first multiple choices. Uh, um, and then you have uh, six in total, six uh, short answer questions in total. You need to choose four out, out of the six. You, you are free to choose whichever four. If you choose more than four, we'll grant all of them and choose the four that we that had the highest, uh, highest scores. Uh, and finally, you have two not answered questions available. You need to choose one from them. So before we um, continue to the exam tips, I want to kind of uh, discuss how you should kind of prepare for the exams. So first of all, you want to go over the lecture slides that um, Jeff covered in the, just, just skip over them and try to associate them with the coding experience you have in the OS 162 to better understand the concepts. And then you want to 
uh, take advantage of the previous uh, exam papers. I believe Jeff has the midterm exam papers for 2015 and also 2014 online. You, you, you may want to uh, download them and try. Also, the better thing is the solutions is also online. So you kind of know what uh, you are expected to answer for those questions. So you, so you want to take a really good look at the previous exam papers and go over the questions and, and try to see uh, what if this is the question that will show up in the exam and how would you uh, answer them and compare your answers to the, um, to the solutions and see what the differences are and how, what's the differences of how you choose to approach the, the problem. So that's some tips on how to prepare for the exam. And uh, finally, for um, from a from, from writing point of view, and uh, this is why I ask you to kind of go over the previous year's exams and know what to expect. So typically, the, the questions are very well asked in the sense that um, at least for long answers, you have a whole big paragraph describing what the background of the problem are, and the, fi and the final paragraph or final two paragraphs of that big blog is here to tell you what, what you are expected to answer. So typically in the final paragraphs, you will say first please do, do this, and then do that, and finally do this. Right? So you want to kind of highlight those points and figure out what, uh, what's your answers for each one of them. We have a lot of students in previous years that just ignore the last part and try to write whatever they want. And you can imagine what happened to them. Basically when we're ready, we cannot grasp what you are saying. Because the question is very clear on what the, what the questions are and what, what the questions are. So you want to um, read the questions first of all and try to figure out what uh, you are expected to answer. Uh, this, is, is, this is taken from uh, exam papers from 2014. Right? You can see uh, the why the I highlighted is what the questions ask, right? So you have very clear instructions on what to answer. Don't be, uh, don't mess up. So this is the, the first tip I have. And the second tip is that uh, you will find in the exam that you, the, the space you have is probably more than what you need to answer the questions, right? So you, you have to decide what you want to write. You cannot just write whatever you need to you know to the papers, which is kind of um, a disaster for us writers to kind of to find out which part you are actually answering the problem. So try to be concise and try to be brief in, in the answers, especially for the answer questions, which you have several pages of space to write. So also, you want to organize the answers according to what the questions are. Ask. If the question asks three sub questions, you want to organize the sub questions in the different part and highlight them to kind of help the writers figure out um, which pro which questions you are going to answer and and what you have wrote. Not do not mess everything into a big paragraph and leave the writers kind of scratch his head to find out uh, what I'm trying to answer. And finally, for the answer questions, you really want to, so for me, the, the time is only 50, 50 minutes. It's a lecture uh, time. For finals, you have three hours, so you don't need to worry about that. But for the midterms, you only have 15 minutes. So for the answers, you need to at least reserve 15 or 20 minutes for that because it's a pretty big part of the um, total scores. So you want to kind of, and I, I haven't seen this year's papers yet, but one thing I can uh, guarantee you is that it will be, uh, it will not be something you have heard of, it will be something new. But the, the, the principles uh, behind this new background will be something we have covered in the lectures. You can get a sense of why I talk about 
by looking at previous years papers. So you want to kind of don't uh, be kind of be stumbled when you see some terms that you don't understand and you haven't seen um, you haven't seen it before. Just try to read it and try to use the knowledge that you learned in the class to kind of link that strange um, uh, examples or strange background to what you have learned. Again, as I have mentioned before, there is usually a big, uh, usually a separate graph, paragraph to tell you uh, what to answer, to tell you what to do. So you want to follow that and try to organize the answer around that um, final paragraph. Um, so this is basically what I got for for the meta groups. For for the rest of the time, um, if you have any questions on the exam papers, I can try to pull them up and try to explain them. Um, <coughs> Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between the TLB and the page table? Well, what's your take on it? So if, if this the question asking the exam, how would you answer it? Oh, uh, no, I mean, I don't think that's actually one of the examples. No, no, I know, just uh, kind of, well, I want to know how, how would you like to answer the question. So page table, what, what is a page table? Um. <clears throat> it's basically a way for you, you can consider it as a dictionary or key value store. The key is the virtual disk, the value is the physical disk. Just that this key value store is organized in a special, in a particular manner. Right? So page table is um, a lookup table for you to organize the translations between the virtual and the physical addresses. The TLB is a very particular form of this. Uh, you cannot even call it a page table. It's just a, a translation between the virtual and the physical page tables. It has very limited uh, functionality and it has very fixed format. Right? Page table, you can design your own page tables. You can use all kinds of page tables as the way you like. But the TLB is just this particular hardware component that is designed in a, in a particular way to do the translation. Right. Another way to think about this is that TLB um, is a hardware component that the hardware will use to do the translation when the hardware don't know uh, where to find the physical, physical uh, page. But the page table in the concept of OS 1.6.1 the, the hardware does not realize the existence of page table at all. Page table is for just for you to kind of help you do the uh, virtual to physical translation. Okay, so we're not using the TLB. You are using the TLB. Are using. As I said, TLB is a hardware component. It will be there whether or not you use it or not. Does that answer your question? I mean, um, from functionality perspective, this tool serves the same purpose. It's just to facilitate, facilitate the translation between virtual and physical addresses. But they do such translation in different, different ways. ITIB is a power um, component that provided to help you do the translation. And page level is designed by you to kind of um, maintain the translations in an organized way so that whenever, whenever there, is need, there is a need for such a translation, you can always consult the page table to find the correct <coughs> translation. Yeah. Uh, so are you saying if, if the page table does the job, why do we need a TLB? If like I said, TLB is a catch. Why do we need a catch? Oh, okay. Um, so, for a to check the TLB, does it need to enter the kernel mode? That's a good question. Does it, so, at least in the case of OS161, that's the case. Mm -hmm. It's a privileged component, and that only kernel mode 
Okay. Yeah. 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 And actually, in fact, um, in user space, you are not aware of the existence of the Only when you are implementing the memory subsystem, you are responsible to manage the tail. Otherwise, when you write a normal SQL in the user space, you don't need to worry about the idea. So, so you don't need to observe the angular kernel to check the TLB, and if there is a miss, it will trigger another exception. No, like I said, thread doesn't care about TLB. So when you write a program, you just manage your so elephant memory, access to memory. You don't need to worry about whether or not this virtual address has a valid uh, physical translation. Whenever you um, access a virtual address that does not have valid transition, you will trap into kernel. The rest is what what is uh, the responsibility of the kernel. More in particular the virtual memory subsystem. Right? And the virtual memory sus subsystem is responsible for uh, to allocate the page for you and set up the TLB entry so you can continue your execution. Thank you.